This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to the second session of the Mini Medical School on HIV, past, present, and future. Um, my name is Diane Havler. I'm professor of medicine at UCSF and chief of the AIDS division at San Francisco General Hospital. I recognize many of the faces here from our uh, first evening and very, want to welcome you back and also to the new faces um, of you who are joining us this evening. It certainly is a lovely evening tonight. The, the moon has just been absolutely gorgeous the last few nights. Um, it's really my pleasure to um, introduce our first uh, speaker, and really um, an honor. Um, Dr. J. Uh, uh, Levy is uh, one of truly the, the, the greatest figures in the story of um, HIV. Uh, he uh, graduated from uh, Columbia Medical School. And then he came to UCSF in 1972, is that right? 71 and uh, set up a virology um, laboratory. And um, Dr. Levy, for those of you who don't know this, is the co-discoverer of the HIV virus. Um, he's going to be talking about that this evening. Um, for those of us who were there at the time, this was clearly a monumental um, discovery and really um, changed everything. But he certainly didn't stop there, and he continued on with a series of very pivotal findings on the pathogenesis, the virology, and the immunology of HIV. He's made fascinating observations on uh, patients who have a very slow um, progression of their disease to try to understand what are some of the naturally protective factors that exist in the body that slow down HIV. Um, I don't have enough time to list all of the honors that Dr. Uh, uh, Levy um, has amassed over the years, but uh, suffice it to say that they are uh, numerous. Um, one of his uh, many, many duties he has right now, he is currently the editor of the journal AIDS, which is the highest impact journal in the AIDS field where we all publish. And I was just speaking with him. He's really, in his leadership role, kept this journal um, at, the, um, at the cutting uh, edge. Um, Dr. Levy is a wonderful teacher. Um, he is really ambassador for AIDS around the world. I think, um, I think I was talking to your wife one time. You've been to almost every country around the world because people invite Dr. Levy to come and talk about his work and to talk about um, HIV. And certainly as a member of the UCSF faculty, I'm so proud to be a co-faculty member um, with Dr. Levy. And I want to sincerely thank him for taking time out of his busy schedule to share with us um, this evening um, the discovery of HIV. So Dr. Levy. Thank you, Diane. That was such a nice introduction, particularly by someone we're so proud to have recruited here during my 30 years <laughs> in HIV. It's uh, wonderful to see the young people take over and do so well. Uh, so I'm going to try to put a mix between what it was like uh, in the early 1980s when, H when AIDS hit, and then go slowly through what my lab was able to do in terms of finding the virus. And then I hope you'll bear with me. I, I feel you should know some of the basic science. And because of what you'll hear later, I am introducing some information on the immune system. Now I see some students here, you all know it, so you, know, you can just you know, say, OK, well, that's what you do when you're a teacher. But uh, it is uh, important to get those basics to follow what's going on afterwards. So. <clears throat> What I'm going to do is 
first mention back in uh, when where, where HIV and the epidemic of AIDS fits. And I think it's very important to recognize that there have been many epidemics. I gave a talk uh, years ago and showed this, the, just the cycles of epidemics, as if you, you get rid of one and then another one takes over. And if you look at all these epidemics, uh, many of them are still here. Uh, measles, we have a vaccine, but you still have children dying of measles because they're not taking the vaccine. And we do have vaccines for the, several of the others, smallpox we've gotten rid of, but uh, it becomes one in which we should accept this as nature's challenge to us. And why do we get these epidemics? Now it's becoming, and HIV is a good example, you get these migration of carriers into cities. And I'm sure you're going, uh, last week's uh, introduction to the clinical and the epidemiology probably showed you this. You, know, you had people leaving with the poverty and with the destruction of barriers in parts of Africa. People left and went into cities, prostitution, poverty, international travel, uh, the sexual behavior, IV drug use. All these things contribute to uh, emergence of, the, of epidemics and certainly the AIDS epidemic. Now, before I get into the actual details of why this virus is so challenging, let me just say all those other agents we know. And HIV now, we've had 30 years to study, and we know a lot about it, but it differs from the other epidemic uh, organisms. It directly attacks immune systems. That's not so different. But it does incorporate, I'm going to show you how this virus becomes part of the chromosomes of the cell. So that means it becomes a resident in the body, and it's very difficult to get rid of, and you become a chronic infection, which can take up to 10 years to reveal any symptoms. Many of you know this, but it becomes an important point to remember, particularly in terms of why many people miss the boat when they thought this virus infects and causes disease right away. The agent frequently changes and modulates itself, and it can recruit other cells into it by direct infection or by cell-to-cell -cell transfer. So let me take you back to 1981, and these were seven deadly symptoms that were described uh, in the San Francisco Chronicle. And if you looked at it, it looked just like the flu. You had, uh, you had a persistent fever, you had lymph, lymph nodes, you had sore, pain, sore aches and pains, uh, you had these, uh, you had herpes uh, lesions that took place, and you see these purpose, purpose uh, lesions on the skin, which we now was, is that cancer, capricity, sarcoma. And I think very important, which has been described, there were neurologic findings very early in this, and no one quite could put it all together. So that's where we were. And then this was one of the ways you kept these, this epidemiology together. You had HIV passed by gay men. You had intravenous drug users. You had, what do you, what do you think this is? Fact, uh, hemophiliacs, that's right, intravenous uh, uh, drugs, newborn babies, and they were pointing the finger at Haitians because there were a lot of cases in Haitians, and that, now we know that's either, I have my own views, either because gay men from New York went to Haiti or Haiti sent out workers throughout the countries and brought it back uh, when they were in different countries. I'm sure you've, you've had this discussed, but I think it's important to get an idea about this while we get started. So this is one of the first signs is this pneumonia, pneumocystis carinii pneumonia. And I have to say in the early days, everyone thought it was a, uh, was a bacteria or something, and then it was discovered that it was actually a fungus. And you can, if you see all of these all of these uh, black circles, uh, you wouldn't ever see that in just a, a small pneumocystis disease, in, let's say in, in a cancer patient. This was easy to find, very, very indicative of an immune system that wasn't working. This is the Capuchy sarcoma. I think this patient was one of the first that we saw. Paul Volberding introduced this man to me. You, you, see the, you see the pattern which suggested to us blood vessels, but it really becomes lymph channels, and I still believe it's the endothelial, the lining of lymph channels, where this really gets started, and it can be on the surface of the skin or in the, inside the body, and now we know the agent responsible for that is a virus. It's a herpes virus, which is called HHV8, or Capuchy sarcoma virus. 
And this is one of the remarkable findings. This was made by the Greenspans, particularly Deborah Greenspan. She was looking at pay, uh, uh, men who were infected with HIV, and she saw this lesion on the side of the tongue. Now, she thought this was probably candidiasis or yeast, and you know about yeast infections, <laughs> but when she did a smear of this, it ended up not showing any of the yeast particles, just what she says, hairy fibers. And she's sort of sorry she gave it that name, but that's what it is. And I can tell you that you'll hardly see this anymore. I was in China at the bottom, at one of these small little villages with my Chinese colleagues. They hadn't seen it. We saw a very sick man. I said, open your mouth. He was covered with hairy leukoplakia. It's on the side of the, of the tongue and in the buccal mucosa. But this is classic. And the Greenspans later with, uh, with uh, Evelyn Lynette showed it's caused by Epstein-Barr virus, the virus that causes infectious mono. Now take yourself back. What do you know about infectious mono? It's passed, right, by kissing, by saliva, but no one knew where the virus could be hiding. Now no one's made it conclusively, but it makes sense that maybe it's living, and we know they're dendritic cells, in the dendritic lining cells in the mouth, particularly the tongue, and then when your immune system falls down, it appears, and it gives you this pathology. Okay, so that's one, one unusual observation, and I'm sure you've covered the fact that when this occurred, we saw it only in uh, San Francisco, <coughs> uh, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Miami, New York, and it was, frankly, I have to say, in the very early days, we thought it was localized, not that widespread, and it didn't take long before it was found. It was already there in Africa. And in a visit in Africa that I made, made some in the, in the 80s, and you went to Kinshasa or in Zaire now, or the Belgian Congo, they had records of, of a disease in the brain, cryptospiridiosis, that was a cryptococcal in, uh, in meningitis that was taking over, and no one knew why. And it ends up that HIV was already there. Can talk about that, and then we some. Then you have AIDS in Africa, which was led to two types of HIV, both one and two. And I find I just brought this in. I don't know if Diane's seen this, but this is one of the things that was so unusual in Africa when we would go is they had yellow nails, and that was no one figured really could figure out what it was, but it was probably the anemia that occurred, but the, that occurs with the loss of red cells, but that was also a characteristic you could bring patients in and they had yellow nail, nails, you know they were infected. Okay, so that's what's happening in the world. And we began being challenged in 1981 in August, August 20th, I think, something like that. Paul Volberding, who had left my lab to become head of the cancer program at, U, at San Francisco General, called me down to discuss a case. And this, the case, came from a man who lived in this area, which is now Noe Valley, which is an area where we have a lot of gay people living. And I'm proud to show Dan Turner. He was the one who showed me that you could fight this disease. Unfortunately, he died just before we got the therapy that worked. Dan had Capuchy sarcoma. And he was presented at, this, at the case. And Don Abrams discussed it as a, as a graduate student. We always like to be a little nostalgic about this. And I was asked to discuss, could this be a virus? Well, I was talking about the cancer. And I had been in Africa and saw herpes virus particles in Capuchy lesions in Africa, which is common there. So I said it could be a herpes. I went into other discussion. But it wasn't what we thought it was. We were thinking it was cytomegalo, another known herpes virus. It took many years to show that this was actually a new herpes virus. And Dan introduced us to what we needed to do, I had a separate, and now bear with me, it's a little, you know, a little over nostalgic, but anyway, this is a tiny little room that was given to me by the university for, uh, for virus research on cancers. It was 80 square feet. You walked in here, <laughs> you had to change here, there was a little uh, plastic uh, uh, board, the, uh, I don't know what, it, a barrier you pulled. Inside you had a baker, you had this uh, biosafety hood, and you worked in there, you had an incubator and, uh, a, um, and microscopes. And what we did was to grow up white cells from these people because we thought later that Capuchy and pneumocystis 
and all these infections was because the immune system wasn't functioning and we began looking at the immune system and we saw this kind of thing and I like to show this to students because you don't need a fancy biochemical reaction you don't need to have a, a, a lot of important technologies just a pair of eyes and a microscope and that's what we saw when you put these cells from a person who had AIDS not the early not the ones with the early signs you see this breakdown of the white cells and things you never see look at this so we call this balloon degeneration because we now know that the envelope of HIV changes the integrity of that membrane of the cell and and salts come in sodium potassium ions come in and what do they bring with them they bring water so it gets big so if people come to my lab if we can really find a, a culture like that it's it's amazing to see it. I mean, we have students coming, young students come through. It's really wonderful to see. It. But if you have to watch it under a hot mi microscopic lamp, it breaks. So if, unless you're pretty fast, you don't see it, but there may be another one formed. And then you get this fusion of the cells, and you get multi oh, many nuclei, 50, 100 nuclei in one big cell. And that will stop growing, and eventually it will die. So I say this because you could have done this in Africa. You could do it in resource-limited countries. You need a pair of eyes. And with that, we were able to assay the fluids from these cells. You take the fluid from these cells, filter it, add it to fresh, normal white cells. You induce this type of, we call it cytopathology, pathology disruption in the cells, cyto is cell. And we then had electron microscopy, and we were able to show the recognition of a retrovirus, and I'll, we'll show what that is, and we call this the AIDS-associated retrovirus, ARV, so it's always very, not amusing, rather shocking to me that the virus is now the way you treat people, but it, that's just the acronym problem. So this then became, was the group we, we started, in the, with, we had very little money in the very first day, maybe four of us working in that, and then we were able to get some funds from the state of California and gradually the government. And this was my group in 1985. I had a little more hair. So here is the, uh, what happened is same time we were isolating virus, the French had isolated virus which they called lymphadenopathy the associated virus because they had lymph nodes and they isolated virus from that. The uh, group in NIH, uh, Bob Gallo's group, thought it was a human T cell leukemia virus, totally wrong, but they named it HTLVV and we called it ARV and we had a big discussion, lots of, dis lots of articles, lot everyone wanted their own acronym, and we came up with human immunodeficiency virus one because the, actually it was just HIV one, then when two was found uh, a, two years later, then it became one two. And they, the, the rule, the rule, the accepted uh, procedure was to name the virus after the city you found it or some. So we call our isolates, we got up to 350 of them. Uh, we called them HIV-1, SF-2, 4, 20, whatever. It's not held up as much and it's unfortunate because it's nice to know where it came from. Well, then the term became human immune deficiency virus or HIV and here is a CD4, a, a white cell producing HIV, all these purple circles are HIV. It's about a thousand particles produced a day by a white cell. Most of them are dead, they won't be infectious, but they are constantly being produced. And when they are produced, they bud from the surface of the cell. So if you can imagine the cell and the virus, you're gonna see this in an animation, virus goes to the edge of the cell and it buds from the surface taking some of the membrane of the cell. So imagine when the early studies were being done, if someone had antibodies to the cell surface because of an autoimmune disease, we had several referred to us, they turned up being positive for HIV, but they weren't. They were responding to the, the membrane proteins that came with the virus. Now it's all been cleaned up. You have very rarely see this. So I'm just going to go through the components that are make, make up any pathogenic course, the virus, the cells, and of course the host. What does the host do to prevent it? And we're gonna first look at the virus, and this becomes important. 
to recognize why, to me, anyone asks, why don't we have a vaccine? Why, are we so, why is it so hard to get rid of this virus? Can we cure from this virus? It becomes part of the chromosome of the cell. So here are the virus particles that are attaching. It's, I'll, I'll comment about that. They inject their nucleus with two RNA molecules. They, one is selected, made a DNA copy that's in blue of itself. That DNA duplicates itself and forms what we call a double helix. Now it looks like a chromosome DNA. It then goes in to the nucleus of the cell, integrates into the chromosome of the cell, and becomes part of the genes of the cell, starts to make the RNA in red, all the proteins are made, they come to the surface, and here's your budding. The yellow is the envelope of the virus, and out buds the virus. Uh, you'll see this again. The important point to remember is this process of RNA to DNA is reverse of the dogma of nature instead of DNA to RNA. So that's why it's a retrovirus. And then when, so their enzyme is reverse transcriptase. We have a drug for that. Then it enters the cell and it integrates. Integrates. We have a drug for that. And then when it buds out, it's in the particle that maturation takes place, and that's done by another viral protein, protease. So those are three enzymes, only three enzymes made by the virus, and they're all hit by various drugs. So here's the process, very briefly described. HIV attaches to the cell, usually through CD4, a molecule on the surface of a, of a, lymph, a, white, a white cell, a lymphocyte, and then it fuses and the core of the virus goes in, and once the core is in, it then goes through the replicative cycle. So very early, many groups, including our own, showed that some of these viruses would grow very well in macrophages, they're another white cell in the body, and in established tumor cell lines, T cell lines. And we found that the ones that through macrophages didn't really give a lot of cytopathology, didn't get a lot of killing. But the ones that went through the T cell line, they did. And gradually it became known that the ones that grew in macrophages used another attachment site. So again, the virus then attaches to CD4, the major receptor, there are others. And then in order to get in, it needs to have a double binding. And that they use is a, what we call a chemokine co-receptor and there are many reasons why this is meaningful, but important for you is to just realize that therefore there are some drugs that are blocking some of these chemokine co-receptors because that will keep the virus from getting inside. Now, I mentioned to you the importance that the virus becomes part of the cell. That becomes, in my opinion, extremely important when you're talking about transmission because most infections for which we have vaccines, which we treat, the free virus enters and you get infections, mumps, measles, chickenpox, so forth. With the virus HIV, the infected cell can enter. It can enter in blood and it can enter in, in seminal fluid and in vaginal fluid. And then when it gets in, it can interact with immune cells, macro, like T cells, macrophages, and mucosal lining cells. So think about that, all our vaccines are against free virus. We've got to get an approach that takes care of the infected cell. Here is a virus, a virus infected cell in seminal fluid. If you saw the whole slide, there'd be two of them, and we were able to estimate that this meant that there are 50,000 infected cells in that seminal fluid. And see what it can do? It can interact with here cervical epithelial cells. And all of these round circles are HIV. Notice there's no HIV around the, surf, around the other surfaces of that cell. It's because there are cellular products that induce that cell to release its virus and it enters the cervical cells of the, the cells of the cervix. You can't directly infect the cervix with the virus. So the infected cells, very important. What happens afterwards? The virus enters and because the enzyme for reverse transcription is not very, uh, uh, is not very sure. It has a lot of errors. There are many errors made, and virus 
that emerges is always selected for that will keep replicating and then these viruses become more cytopathic, they go to the brain, they're selected. So I would say with each replicative cycle, there's up to 10 mutations. And there's selection for one, but there's so many. Remember, thousands of particles being made. So, so that's how it happens. And then these are, these are studies made with the AIDS virus of the monkey, which you inoculate, and this is free virus. They don't do a lot of work with virus-infected cells. So that's one of my concerns, but it's tough to do that. But if you just take free virus, where does it end up first? In the cervix. Day set three, in the cervix. Day seven, in the cervix. Then it spreads to the rest. Very important, because that means it could be walled off and kept in the cervical area and never spread to the body. It becomes important to recognize that. Now, my colleagues, when we started talking about HIV, said, well, it grows in white cells, uh, cells of the immune system, uh, and then, then they were reluctant to believe it grew in macrophages and then other cells. But now you can see what's happened. There are, the, depending on the type virus, and each virus in each one of you differs by somewhat less than 1%, but they always are different. Even, maybe only, but even in, in the studies of triplets, when they get the virus out, it looks somewhat different, but not as different as in the individuals because the immune system <laughs> makes that difference. Here are all the cells in the body that can be infected, depending on which virus you have. The, the white cells, the skin, the brain, the bowel, the, the uh, kidney, and uh, the prostate. This is virus in the, in the endothelial cells of the bowel. Here's virus in the endothelial cells of the kidney. And there are a bunch of viruses in the brain. So this is a virus that isn't just in the immune system. And when we go to talk about cure or we go to talk about treatment, we've got to take care of the virus in the other areas. Then when you look at the virus, it has these types of characteristics. It can differ. Some virus will grow better in macrophages. I mentioned that. Some will even enter fibroblasts. Some will go into glial cells of the brain. Some will replicate rapidly to high level. They used to be, they're usually the more dangerous ones. Some will replicate slowly to low level. And of course, some will be of a lot of cell killing, others will not. So you're seeing what we call the heterogeneity of the viruses, thousands of subtypes, and we have to control them all. Now why is this spreading so easily with HIV? Affected individuals remain healthy for many years. The average is a nine or 10 years. Wouldn't know you gyrate the virus. Virus can be transmitted by the infected cell. To me, that's one of the most important, most important lessons to take home today. It's spread by sexually transmission, and we've never really controlled sexual transmission. Mutates at a rapid rate, and it's resistant to the immune system. I've been talking mostly about the first discovery, which is HIV-1, and as I mentioned two, day, two years later, <laughs> HIV-2 was found. It does the same thing, but is not as pathogenic. It does not replicate to the same extent as HIV in the blood, in the body, and therefore it is not as, uh, well, if you could say dangerous, but it doesn't give it often to AIDS as HIV does. This is the structure of the virus. I'm, not, uh, I'm just going to mention the envelope is where that interacts with the cell and its receptors, and inside is the core and this is called P24, P25, for those of you that are studying and may see uh, results on levels of the virus, they may give it on, the, on those, in that uh, type of readout. And the structure of the virus, one and two is very similar. I'll just point out that the center area is the complexity of this type of virus, a lentivirus or the retrovirus. These You'll hear more about them, I think, in the lectures. These determine and help the virus replicate in different cells. It determines how well the virus replicates, how quickly it replicates, and how it can control the cell and produce a lot of progeny. With the discovery of HIV-1, and I mentioned to you how there's one mutation every time it re replicates, with more information coming mostly from Africa, around the Cameroons, you again may hear of this, 
there have been subtypes of HIV-1 and HIV-2 distinguished. Group N, which is the major type, responsible for over 99 percent of the infections worldwide. But you have others that are appearing that are fascinating, found in uh, maybe just a few people. And we don't know whether that's an evolving epidemic or whether there are, these are people that already had these viruses and are now being recognized. And probably the most fascinating aspect to the virology is that people can be infected by more than one virus. And if they are infected by more than one virus and a cell goes, has more than one virus going in it, now imagine that cell has an RNA. You saw how the RNA becomes a DNA. Well, if there's in the, in the environment of the cell, before it goes to integrate, if you had more than one type of RNA, it can share its message for the next virus. And this is one of the most amazing viruses. It was, uh, it was isolated by uh, Rafael Najera in Madrid. And it has one, two, three, four, seven, and then an unknown. These are all the subtypes that are known, all that in that person. Guess where this virus is from? Cuba. Why Cuba? Because Fidel sent all, the, all his people out to Africa. They came back with all the strains in Africa. And this is where you see a real mixing. You see it in Africa, too, but this is unusual. OK, let's turn to the host, which is an area that we are now emphasizing in my group. So we've got the virus, many different types. If you go to hit just one, you got all the others that could take place. Uh, can the host really control all the different viruses that may be presenting as HIV? So let me give you your 101 in the immune system. OK. So we have two major responses in the immune system. One is antibodies. You may know about this. These are circulating proteins that bind to the virus or to cancer cells. And they are produced by cells that emerge in the bone marrow. And they're called B cells. There's a lot of reasons for why. But bone marrow is good enough, you'll remember it. Bone marrow derived cell. The other cells come and they interact directly with a virus-infected cell or with a cancer cell. And this is cellular immunity. And they are, the dominant ones are T cells. They come from the thymus up here. They circulate through. Primordial cells circulate through. They get programmed to be T cells. And then they go out and they do the work that we call effector. They go and find infected cells. They find cancer cells. They meet them and they destroy them. And you'll see that we find one other way in which they work. Then you have some cells that emerged uh, separately from this. And they're very important. One is the NK cell, which is called natural killer NK cell, which was found by a scientist because they were, when he was looking at the ability of T cells to kill, he found there were and when he took white cells, there was a background of killing. He didn't understand it. And he discovered that there are natural killer cells, cells that recognize a cancer cell and kill it just because they're programmed to do that. Pretty nice. And you'll, some of that you'll work in, you, you will hear about. And then there are the macrophages or monocytes that also interact to keep this balance. Without going through details, let me just assure you the immune system is very much checks and balances like we would like to see. Uh, in life. And so you have some that will enhance the immune system. They will give rise to autoimmune diseases. And those that will suppress the immune system, that will give rise to immune deficiencies like, like AIDS. But if you balance them, then you have a normal, a, a normal functioning immune cell. We're going to talk about T lymphocytes, thymic derived lymphocytes. They have on their surface molecules that have been given a name, usually CD. For those of you who want to know, it means cluster differentiation. But that's because a committee got together and decided we'll name these. They were named originally because antibodies were developed against these cells in mice. And then they, these antibodies bound to these cells selectively. And you could then detect them by a flow cytometer. I'm going to show you that. So here. The, all T cells carry CD3, 
Then you break into a helper cell that helps the immune system function and CD8 cells that suppress or kill uh, their CD8 cells. And then you can go into separate subtypes of these. So how, how did we discover this? I have to say that the discovery of the flow cytometer by the Hertzenbergs in, in Stanford was extremely important for immunology because we wouldn't have known how to classify the different white cells that occur. And it, they, their discovery came a few years before HIV. So this was the one disease where CD4s and CD8s really became known, became everyone's conversation. And how do we do this? You take blood from a person, you throw in antibodies to, these are pro, a cell, a pro, antibodies that will attach to a particular cell, NK cell, CD3 cell, through lots of discovery. They'll, they'll attach to that cell. You then come in with a, another antibody that attaches to that antibody. And that second antibody has a fluorescent stain. All right? And you wash in lights. And then you go into this flow cytometer. And what's the flow cytometer? You put it through. If you come up to my lab, fortunately we have one. You can send your cell suspension through here. And it's bombarded by these laser beams. And the cell fluoresces. If it fluoresces red, it may be CD3. If it's green, it's CD8, and so forth. And this is what it looks like. It's much smaller. This, we're not as modern as the more recent ones. But uh, it goes through this machine and comes out on a computer. And the computer tells you how much of each cell type you have. And this is how it does it. This is, you know, it'll say, this is, this is, these are two markers. And it'll find the cell that has one or the two markers. And it will then read out as, out of all the white cells you've given me, 20% are T cells or 40% are B cells. Do you see it? So when someone talks about the CD4 and CD8 ratios, this is it. And you want twice as many as CD4s as CD8s. And this is how you would recognize the helper T cell. Generally, it's CD4 and CD3, but you can use other markers that are important. And they're all fluorescent a different way. Now, in the early days, the Hertzenberg, you could do two color. Now you can do 500 colors. It's all gradations of green and red and pink and silver. It's amazing. I, I, so I don't think we ever need all that information, but some people do. OK, so when you're, when you're looking at HIV infection, one of the first things that was discovered was that CD4s were down. So here's the normal CD4s. CD4s are down. Would never be able to do that without the flow cytometer. And this is the hallmark of AIDS, you're losing. It occurs with other viruses, but you don't reach this large, this very deep level and reduction in CD4s. And when you drop that low with CD4, CD4s are helper cells, the immune system crashes. So it gives me an opportunity to at least introduce you a little bit to what the work that we had, we had done in those early days. And that began in, in October 84 when a young man came to see us and he thought he'd been exposed and he wasn't sure he was infected. We isolated virus from his blood. He hadn't yet made antibodies, so he, we wouldn't have known he's infected. So we were the first to show you could carry the virus and no one would know it. Well, he then seroconverted, but look at this. After February of 1985, isolation, we could not, I couldn't isolate virus. You can't. You just put his white cells in the culture. Virus won't come out. So we thought maybe. He had 300 CD4s here, 600 to 1,200 is normal. Here he had over 1,000. So not only could we get virus out of his blood by the techniques we used, we couldn't, but his CD4s were coming back in his body. So we thought he may have gotten rid of the virus. No, he didn't. He maintained his antibodies. And that led to the discovery early that there are people, amazingly, who can control the virus. I came from training with the Henleys who discovered Epstein-Barr virus and in infectious mono, and they said to me, Jay, when I was a student, you learn from long-term survivors. So I call these people long-term survivors. People in the East Coast call them long-term non-progressors. I find my term a little bit more, more, more uh, positive. So uh, these are people infected for more than 10 years, 
and they don't have any therapy. They have a normal CD4 count. They have a low viral load that we can measure now. They have not a lot of immune activation, which comes with virus replication. And there are some people whose viral load is so low, it's, you can't even detect it. And we call those elite controllers. And I don't know if Steve Deeks is going to talk about that or Peter Hunt will. But these are unusual people. I think they're part of a bell-shaped curve. Some people believe they are separate. I think they just are controlling better than anyone else. Now, what is the reason for this? You could blame it on the virus, but after you've taken virus out of people who are long-term survivors, by a technique I'll show you, you'll see the virus is not the reason. It's the immune system. And we began looking then to see, okay, if this cell is infected, this is the cell that usually controls viruses. Let's remove that cell. And that's what we did. So we took white cells, removed the CD8 cell. It's in red. The C, the, all the white cells here are, are different colors. And amazed we were, eight days later, virus came out. We then took those red, those CD8 cells, and we added them back to infected CD4 cells, and the virus went away, completely away. You could keep the CD8 from a person for three weeks, and they still were able to do it. So we, we found that CD8 cells don't need to kill, they can suppress. And they suppress in a very efficient way so that there was two types of activity for a CD8 cell. The classic killing, and then one in which you suppress the virus. And we went on to show that if a person has asymptomatic, one CD8 cell can control in a cell culture virus replication in 20 CD4s, but when you developed AIDS, it was just the opposite. You need a lot of CD8s to do this. And then we went on, Chris Walker who worked with me, you separate the two cells. Before they were held together, you put CD8 cells in one bottom of a well, you have a filter, and there's a soluble substance that's made. Now you're looking at <laughs> what has been almost 20 years of work to identify this factor. It's brand new. We're, we're making headways, but it's made in such small amounts, it's a real challenge for determining what it is. I, I usually talk about this like a cancer biomarker. We only have really two cancer biomarkers, PSA and CA125, because they're so difficult. Be every cancer has a bioma, has a marker, but to find it in the blood is a real challenge. We have that same challenge, and I hope what, we, what we're doing will be a means for finding cancer biomarkers. I'll just, uh, and uh, well, a few more minutes. If you look at a person over time, you'll find the CD8 cells very strong. It drops over time. The virus comes out, and the person advances. So some of the long-term survivors, some of the people, everybody who's healthy makes this factor. Then as the factor re is reduced, the virus comes back, and they advance. So here we are in a lab. We're studying long-term survivors, and people coming in, and they are telling us, I think I'm infected, we find that they are perfectly healthy, and then if you follow them, we've been following people for over 30 years, they then remain healthy. We have people who are 35 years documented, 1978 blood tests, and they were volunteered for hepatitis B studies, was positive for HIV, they are perfectly healthy, and they are continuing to make CAF, this we call it CAF, CD8 factor. So it's really very encouraging. We just wish we could do it to everybody infected and bring that immune response. Well, in the midst of that, we had partners coming and saying, I've been exposed to my partner all the time and I've never got infected. So we began looking and one of the most unusual were, this, were five sets of twins that were sent to me from Zambia by Sudesh Hira, identical twins, one infected, one not, same placenta. This one, very poor CD8 response. This one, a good CD8 response. And we began to see this one, who's protected, no virus, has a CD8 response. And we began looking then at wives of hemophiliacs, infected hemophiliacs. They're having intimate sexual contact. And what we noted was that if they had been exposed multiple times in the last six months, they had this CD8 antiviral response 
all the time. If they, hadn't been, if they had been exposed within six to 12 months, they still, some of them still had it. But it, those who started using barrier condoms or so for protection, they lost it. So that indicated to us that this is a innate, natural immune response against the virus. It also made us think in terms of vaccine development that we may need many boosters if we want this type of response to protect. But it's certainly what we come away with is believe that in these individuals, they're exposed to the virus or the viral proteins, the CD8 start, cells start making the CD8 antiviral factor, or CAF, and they get what you call booster shots. And they build up the CD8 cells so now they can protect against, and I meant to, meant to tell you, all HIV, all HIV-1, all HIV-2, all the simian virus. This is a very good way of protecting against all the viruses. It's natural, it's found in long-term survivors and asymptomatic individuals, and this becomes one of our big mantras. Let's put some energy and resources into immune therapy. You're gonna hear a little bit about uh, cure because we certainly would like to see a cure, and our group is now beginning to do some work with YW Khan to manipulate stem cells so they lack the CCR5 receptor. This goes back to what we, what I guess they're gonna have a, uh, yeah, you'll have a talk about the cure, about the Berlin patient who got transplanted with white cells from an individual who naturally does not have the, C, uh, the chemokine co-receptor for the entry of the virus. And this one is attempting to do to get a cure. And I'll just end with a vaccine uh, because this is what we really want. Uh, it's gotta get an early innate immune response. I would like to see this, a vaccine induce our type of CD8 antiviral response. You gotta have the cellular, right? The CD, the T cell and the B cell type responses. Get antibodies that neutralize. And there are some antibodies that increase the infection. That's another topic. You don't want that. Local immunity, and you want it to be safe. So here are some of the challenges of developing an AIDS vaccine. Remember, you saw the picture. It integrates into the cellular uh, genome. The infected cell can transmit the infection. We've never had a vaccine against a cell. Cell-to-cell -cell transfer can take place. Numerous virus variants are there and the virus compromises the immune system. So it's amazing that, first of all, that we have these long-term survivors and we have these people who are exposed and never get infected, but also that we can attempt to get a vaccine. And I end with what we have tried to do, and that's to make a vaccine in plants. And this was done, is being, was being done with Avi Lee, not a relative, at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel. And he gave a lecture, and I went up to him later, and I said, if I gave you genes for a virus, do you think you could put it into a tomato plant? He works on tomato plants. So he says, yeah. He said, we can try it. So he did. He got the cotyledons, introduced the genome for HIV-2, uh, the envelope, and the, and, the cert and the internal gag protein. He got the cotyledons to reach a certain stage and develop it. He formed a plant, ground up the leaves. We had, we had the envelope and we had the gag protein expressed. The only problem is, uh, <clears throat> it's always the excuse of researchers, funding was dropped, uh, and so we never got to see a fruit. But I have to end with saying that I gave this lecture uh, when we first did this, and someone raised their hand and said, Dr. Levy, why did you use tomatoes? I mean, monkeys are not gonna eat tomatoes, you should have used, of course, bananas. I said, well, Dr. Avi Levy doesn't work with tomatoes, so I, you know, we have to do what we can work with. Well, two days later, a veterinarian from Davis sent me this picture. So that's <laughs> the thing. We learn, we learn by experimentation. So uh, that's fine. I'll end with just saying this is a, a book that we, we have out and has all the other information about uh, where you can find uh, what I've talked about. Thank you all very much. <laughs> because the suppressor cells do not have CD4, which is a receptor for it, and they don't have, they may have the chemokine co-receptors, but that's the really, the big point. And it becomes uh, one of nature's surprises. Certain fibroblasts are not, the vagina, for instance, can be infected by a different receptor. 
but CD8s are not. And I think one of the reasons could also be they are naturally producing this factor that we've described. So I, I repeat the question. I, one was if you, the use of antiretroviral drugs I got, could you use that against all the viruses? And you're going to hear a, a, a discussion on that, but I'll quickly answer. What was the first part? Oh, for an antimicrobial peptide that may work as a microbicide to prevent uh, infection, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Okay, so for both of those, I think you'll have a lecture on that, but there are some approaches in which you're looking at putting microbicides uh, into the vagina and uh, try to block a um, HIV infection. There's, it's a whole area of study. It hasn't worked very well. Here's the inter, inter point in point. You got to use if you use a microbicide, it might not work as well as just a, 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 a non-toxic non, uh, chemical that coats the vagina because the infected cell could always interact, as I showed you, and a microbicide might not block it. The lesson they learned with these microbicides is they said, well, we're going to put in a microbicide that kills the infected cell. Well, I was pleased that they were going to look at that, but they didn't think it out because what happened was it killed the vagina cells. So therefore, they had actually increased the infection. Now for the antiretroviral drugs, thank, we've gotten terrific drugs now. They can work on many different viruses, but just like we learned with bacteria, the virus, because it keeps replicating, you can select for a virus that will be resistant to the drugs that you're using. Fortunately, in this country, there are over 20 different drugs you can use and you can change them. One of the things you'll hear about is in the early days, a lot of toxicity. Um, I'm still concerned about the somewhat toxicity that you get from these drugs. Uh, I usually think of it as saying, if it would be like treating cancer your lifetime with a chemotherapy, and you've got to then be very much aware of the fact that watch these drugs so that they are not causing any toxicity to other parts of your body. They will do it in some cases, but fortunately, very few over the period of time that have been watched so far, okay? My own, my own point of view is that you better, one has to be selective on treating treatment for prevention. It's a big topic, right? People are going to be as, uh, <clears throat> as careful in their use of, of uh, using these drugs so that we personally feel that in some people there is a natural resistance and I hope that we can maintain it. Actually, my hope is that we can induce this type of natural resistance through some kind of therapy. Well, fascinating as it is, about two weeks ago, I was cleaning up my files and I got to eight, uh, S and I found Randy Schultz's original writings to me. And he said, Jay, does this accurately say what you were doing? And whatever I answered, it was, it was accurate. I mean, when he, when he finally put it together. So it was very nice, as a good reporter would do. There are, we have, ter in, as a scientist, as any clinician in HIV, it's terrible to have newspaper, uh, to have science writers who don't know science and who, to, who give the wrong information to the public. You see that all the time. And Randy was a very careful writer, absolutely. Okay, let's. Now we're going to move from the lab to the clinic for the second part of our um, evening. And it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Um, Brad Hare. Uh, Dr. Hare is from West Virginia. He went to Harvard in medical school at Duke, and then he came to UCSF. Um, from the moment that he got here, he was really a, uh, a star in the clinic. And um, about five years ago, he was asked to um, direct uh, uh, the clinic on Ward 86. And as you recall from hearing about the history of um, the AIDS epidemic um, last week, Ward 86 at San Francisco General Hospital really was one of the first clinics in the world to open its doors um, for specifically for HIV care. And so um, it, it really is an honor to be asked to lead the clinic. And um, Dr. Harris really done a wonderful job over the last um, uh, couple of years in his post. Um, Dr. Hare is an expert in antiretroviral therapy. 
Um, hepatitis C has just burst open, um, both for HIV infected and non-infected patients. He is one of the uh, country's lead experts in treating uh, hepatitis C and HIV infected patients. Um, for those of you who know the lingo in the hospital, he's really a go-to person for um, tough clinical cases, and he's also a wonderful teacher. So this evening, um, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce him and to share with you that he will be talking to us today about some of the interesting cases that we have in Ward 86, which I can tell you are always challenging and interesting. Thank you, Dan. I'm happy to come back again. Um, and it's really an honor to be uh, sharing a podium with two such really wonderful figures in the fields of, a field of HIV, Dr. Havlier and Dr. Levy, both of whom have made just tremendous uh, um, contributions scientifically, um, personally to this epidemic. Um, so this is mini medical school, so you all get treated like medical students today, and I'm going to take you on rounds with me. So one of the things that we do in teaching medical students is to uh, have them shadow us in clinic. Uh, you're going to go on the ward, you're going to go into clinic with me, and we're going to spend a day together uh, on Ward 86 and at San Francisco General. So this is what it's like. Um, and it's, it's typical of what it's like. We have too many cases for the time that we have, so we'll get to as many as we can and, and go from there. So just by way of background, um, uh, one of the hallmarks of HIV infection, as Dr. Levy has outlined, is its, uh, the immunosuppression that we see. It's one of the first features that we've identified um, in the clinical syndromes of AIDS, and it was with the uh, identification of these very unusual pathogens causing disease in otherwise what appeared to be young, healthy uh, individuals. Uh, the term that we use for that is these pathogens are opportunistic infections. They are opportunistic and take advantage of a weakened immune system where in people with healthy immune systems, they might not cause disease. Um, so uh, these are, this is a list of some of the common infections that we see uh, in people with HIV, uh, broken down by uh, the typical uh, infectious disease lingo, bacterial infections, fungal infections, viral infections, and parasitic infections. Um, and you can see some of these, you, I'm sure you recognize many of them. Many of these infections people can get if they're HIV negative and otherwise healthy, tuberculosis, sexually transmitted infections, um, shingles. Uh, those infections may be more common or more severe in people with weakened immune systems. And many of these infections you won't see very often or very mildly in people with uh, healthy immune systems. Dr. Levy pointed out the, uh, one of the heralding uh, infections of HIV uh, AIDS epidemic was pneumocystis pneumonia, a very uncommon infection uh, in people whose immune systems are healthy. But these are the, have become the, the hallmarks of the uh, uh, immune deficiency, the clinical manifestations of the immune deficiency of HIV and AIDS. And what we know, in addition to the, the, uh, uh, the history that Dr. Levia outlined, where the CD4 count, CD4 cells over time are decreasing, as those cells reach certain thresholds, different types of infections really emerge. There's a different degree of immune suppression that's necessary, for example, to have uh, a clinical syndrome of cytomegalovirus infection than there is with tuberculosis or pneumocystis. So we can almost tell what infections people are likely to be at risk for based on uh, understanding what their CD4 count uh, measurements are. So with that brief background, I'm going to take you through a clinic. So we're going to start out in the clinic. It's uh, uh, Friday morning and we see our first case. This is a young gay man who was newly diagnosed with HIV infection who comes to the clinic with his first visit. Um, and unfortunately, we are seeing so many um, new infections. Uh, young gay men remain one of the most at-risk groups in San Francisco, particularly young men of color, African-American and Latino men. Um, and we see this uh, all too commonly. Uh, this patient got tested because he started losing weight and he noticed white patches in his mouth. So he got tested at a community testing site and found out he was positive. And when we see him and do an exam, this is what his mouth looks like. Anybody have thoughts? Shout it out. Thrush. 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 Yes. So this is thrush. Um, this is oral candidiasis. Thrush is caused by the uh, yeast uh, candida, which is a ubiquitous fungus that's found on uh, all of our skin, mucous membranes. It can cause disease in Healthy individuals causes a number of different kinds of diseases, uh, vaginal candidiasis, oral candidiasis. In people who have a suppressed immune system, it can cause more serious infections in the bloodstream or in other organs. Um, 
In HIV, this hallmark of thrush was really an early indicator of immune suppression. And before we had the ability to measure CD4 counts, as Dr. Levy uh, uh, highlighted for us, we used these clinical markers to estimate the degree of immune suppression. And when someone showed up with thrush, we knew their immune system was weak enough that they could be at risk for things like pneumocystis pneumonia and other serious infections. Typically, it's, uh, this is a very typical case, white plaques on an erythematous or red base on the mucous membranes. When you wipe off these plaques, they wipe off very easily and leave a red spot. And you can take the white uh, stuff that you wipe off and look under a microscope, and you can uh, put potassium hydroxide on it, and that will dissolve some of the components but leave the yeast. And under the microscope, you can see the yeast and make a good clinical diagnosis. We don't really need to do that in most cases. We can just look at that and tell like you did. Um, more severe infections, this can also go down the esophagus and cause terrible pain with swallowing. Um, that's esophageal candidiasis. Um, that can be diagnosed clinically or with endoscopy, taking a camera and looking down the esophagus. We treat thrush with topical antifungals if it's isolated to the mouth, uh, lozenges or liquids that contain antifungal medication, or more commonly we use oral pills such as fluconazole or any other, uh, or se one of several other um, oral medications to treat thrush. And we can treat this, but the problem is as long as the immune suppression remains, the individual's at risk for having recurrence of the clinical thrush. All right, so this patient, we diagnosed uh, his condition. We're not going to talk about the many other issues that would be certainly interesting to talk about with this young man, but we're going to focus on some of the other uh, uh, infections and clinical diseases that we see in patients. So our second patient is a, a gentleman 53 years old who has AIDS. His CD4 count is 24. By definition, that makes him a, def uh, a case of AIDS. His viral load, HIV viral load, is very high at 500,000. Um, he previously has declined the use of antiretroviral medications or antiviral prophylaxis um, until recently. So he's been known to be infected, but has declined therapy. Um, he did finally decide on uh, accepting therapy four months ago, and his uh, uh, virus began to decline and his CD4 count began to come up, indicating a response to the therapy. Um, however, over the last two days, he's noticed a painful rash that started on his right shoulder, um, has uh, spread to his chest and his neck, and it's so painful, the sheets hurt to touch it, and he can't sleep. It's herpes zoster, shingles, exactly. You all are great medical students. They can come on around with me anytime. So that's what shingles looks like. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll just show, this is actually the, the case of the patient. The hallmarks of shingles, the classic description that we hear, this is a herpes virus infection, um, varicella zoster. Um, the description is grouped vesicles which are blisters, on an erythematous or red base. And you can see in the, the, uh, the inlet there, that's a, the inset, that's a very classic example of what zoster looks like. It typically follows what we call dermatomal pattern. So zoster is really a reactivation of the chickenpox virus that once we have it, lives um, often uh, quiescently in our nervous system in a part of the spinal cord known as the dorsal root ganglion. But when uh, the immune system is weakened or other factors allow this to be reactivated, it spreads right along the virus, the, uh, the nerves that line the, uh, the skin in typical patterns, we call dermatomal patterns. And because it's on one side or the other, shingles should only affect one side of the body. Um, so this gentleman's is only on the right. Um, zoster shingles can happen in anybody. It's more common in healthy people as we age. Um, in HIV, it's 20 times more common than people who are HIV negative. And we often see it not too long after the initiation of antiretroviral therapy when the immune system begins to kick back in and this virus then reactivates. Um, in HIV, it can be more severe, often affecting more than one of these nerve distributions, these dermatomes. And the problem with, with herpes zoster or shingles is that it can leave a really, really difficult uh, syndrome afterwards of chronic pain called post-hepatic neuralgia. It's a very, very difficult and painful process that can be hard to treat, and this is really why we want to give uh, antivirals during the acute infection, the zoster outbreak, if we can, to prevent that. As you all did, we can usually identify this on our clinical um, uh, uh, exam, but if we need to, we can culture or do other laboratory techniques to identify the virus, and we can give antiviral medication to, uh, to interrupt this. Um, if it's a severe infection, involving many dermatomes or involving the eye, where this can be a tremendously serious and site-threatening infection, uh, we need to give intravenous uh, antivirals. And we need to start this soon uh, to get benefit. 
There, are, uh, there is a vaccine, as many of you I'm sure are probably aware. It's indicated um, in healthy populations over the age of 60. As we age, we are more likely to get shingles, so we vaccinate people over the age of 60 to prevent that, and mainly to prevent post-hepatic neuralgia. Um, and it's being studied uh, for safety and its efficacy in people who are HIV positive, um, but it appears that it actually may be uh, safe and efficacious, and I expect we'll be using this more in our HIV-infected patients. All right, so our third case. Again, you're noticing that we see a lot of low CD4 counts here. This is where all these opportunistic infections show up. This is a 34-year-old woman with AIDS. Uh, due to some uh, other life issues and some other barriers to her engaging in care, she's not really been able to take advantage of the great antiretroviral medications we have, despite our best efforts to keep her engaged in care. And she shows up now saying that she's had two weeks of seeing floaters in her eye. So you send her, this is an emergency. You send her emergently to the eye clinic, and what are you worried about? CMV. So it could be in a number of things. So all of these conditions don't always have one answer. The term we use in, in, in medicine is a differential diagnosis. We have many different diagnoses that this could be, and we prioritize those based on our clinical findings, and we investigate um, all or some of them that seem appropriate. I think I heard some people suggest herpes virus. We can certainly have herpes virus, even varicella virus infections in the eye. Toxoplasmosis can infect the eye. Syphilis can affect the eye. So our differential diagnosis is really quite wide, but these are all very severe infections and require emergent um, uh, evaluation. So our patient, this is what they saw in the eye clinic. Um, so this is uh, a dilated eye exam. It's very hard to see an eye ground, the retina, the back part of the eye. We can see through fundoscopic exam in the clinic, but it really helps to dilate the pupil so you can really get a good view in the back, and that's what they can do in the, in the eye clinic. So they dilate that. On the right side is what a typical normal eye should look like. Um, and this would be her left eye with the nose on my side of the field and her ear on the other side of the screen. Um, and the light colored or yellow circle that you see is the optic disc with the optic nerve coming out uh, as well as the blood vessels. The center uh, of the eye, that darker area, is called the macula, which is an area of the eye that has particularly uh, uh, acute vision, very, uh, very detailed vision. Um, so we can see the difference here really quite apparently in the normal eye compared to our patient, where along these blood vessels, we see white exudates, and the little red spots are actually hemorrhage. Um, it's located more peripherally in the eye field. Fortunately, this infection starts at the periphery and works its way in where it's more devastating uh, around the optic nerve or the macula and can cause uh, detachments of the retina, which um, are sight-threatening, and this can really cause blindness, which is why it's an emergency. So as you uh, astutely observed, this is cytomegalovirus, CMV retinitis. Um, CMV is another herpes virus. It's a very common uh, virus. It's often acquired sexually or through intimate contact. Um, there can be a clinical syndrome of acute CMV, and like other herpes viruses, once we get it, we don't get rid of it. Um, we look at sexually active adult gay men, 85% of them test positive for having been exposed to CMV. Um, and in heterosexual populations, still more than half test positive for exposure to CMV. And this infection really represents a reactivation of latent CMV infection when the immune system gets weak. Um, the typical presentation of CMV in the eye is what this patient had. They described floaters in the vision. There can be other visual changes, decreased visual acuity, or even blindness. So again, this is a very serious infection. Um, CMV is not limited to the eye. It can cause disease in other organs. Uh, in the digestive tract, it can cause ulcers, painful ulcers and bleeding in the uh, esophagus or colon. It can cause diseases of the brain and central nervous system. It can cause pneumonia and also liver infection. So this is really quite a, a dangerous infection. We don't worry about it till CD4 count gets really quite low, but at this woman's uh, CD4 count of 24, um, she's perfectly at risk for CMV uh, infection. Uh, we can do these antibody tests on the blood, which just indicate that someone has previously been uh, exposed to CMV. It doesn't necessarily mean they're actively having uh, symptoms of infection, but really it's a clinical diagnosis, and just as this patient did, the eye exam was the key. These large, creamy white areas with granular borders following the blood vessels with hemorrhages, um, you know, for some reason, which I never quite understood, other than I think we can all uh, come to some agreement, we like um, food-related terms 
in describing medical conditions. So this is cottage cheese and ketchup. And you can see where that comes from. Um, but I guess it just evokes a strong visual response from us. Um, so treatment here is with uh, intravenous or oral antiviral medications. Um, and there are ocular implants. Um, uh, the goal here is both to preserve sight in the infected eye. Generally, one eye is infected, both may be. But we also want to give systemic treatment, treatment to the entire body rather than just to the eye, so that we can protect the second eye the, uh, from getting infected. And that's a bit about CMV. All right, the next case we see in clinic. This is a 57-year-old man who's been positive for 25 years. He's taken many, many antiretroviral medications over time. And currently, he's uh, got a CD4 count of 326, which doesn't put him in the same danger category with CD4 counts as our other patients, but it's certainly not normal. A normal CD4 count would be 500 to 1,200 or so. Uh, his antiretroviral therapy is effective, uh, as we can tell, because his HIV viral load is undetectable. Um, and he has a complaint that says, my face and legs are too skinny. Dysplasia? Lipodystrophy? Yeah, so there can be a number of different things. HIV causes weight loss. There's an HIV weight loss condition. Um, this patient looks like this. So it's not really just a general weight loss that we're seeing in this condition. It really is specific areas of fat loss, um, commonly in the face, um, under the zygomatic arch in the cheeks, in the temples. There can be peripheral fat loss in the arms and legs, which give you an appearance like on the left where the veins are really quite prominent. It looks like the veins are enlarged, which would be a condition called venomegaly. But in fact, it's just the fat around the veins is lost. So it's called pseudo-venomegaly. It's not really enlarged veins. It just looks that way because the fat is lost. Um, there can also be loss of fat in the buttocks. Um, and as part of this syndrome, which may be really a distinct uh, uh, real syndrome, um, under the heading of lipodystrophy, this fat loss is lipo or fat atrophy. There can also be abnormal fat gains or lipohypertrophy. We typically see the abnormal fat gains in areas called the dorsocervical fat pad, which is on the back of the neck, um, commonly referred to as a buffalo hump, um, or uh, inside the abdomen um, around this fat normally lining the viscera, the organs in our abdomen, and that fat can become enlarged uh, in HIV as well. And those uh, two terms together, lipohypertrophy and lipoatrophy, are called lipodystrophy. This is a really um, stigmatizing condition. It's a really visual reminder of what uh, HIV can do. Um, and I, and I, I can tell you that patients are really, really quite concerned about this. Um, we understand it to be um, driven by potentially different things. There are different factors. There seem to be genetic factors. Um, as well as HIV itself, and very, very significantly, certain medications that we use to treat HIV, or more, I should say really that we used to use, we don't use anymore, are strongly associated with the development of this condition. Um, so people that have been treated for a long time may have in their past been exposed to these other medications that set up this condition in the long term. It seems that some of this may be related to mitochondrial damage uh, in the fat cells. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They provide the energy. Um, for the cellular metabolism, and those seem to be deranged in this condition when we do fat biopsies. Um, there isn't great treatment for this condition. Uh, we definitely want to remove any potentially offending medications. Our current medications, while not completely exonerated from this, are much, much less likely to cause this condition than some of the ones we would use even five or ten years ago. Um, surgery or cosmetic procedures can be an option. And there are FDA-approved facial fillers for injection. Um, and dermatologists, cosmetic surgeons, and others can inject uh, these fillers with really great, great results. They often require touch-up or ongoing treatments. Um, um, and uh, surgery for some of these conditions is really modestly effective. We tend not to be able to operate on these dorsal cervical fat pads, the buffalo hump. It tends to come back. Um, we do operate when it is uh, causing uh, impingement on the spine or the, the vertebral column. Um, and there is an FDA-approved medication that reduces the fat uh, inside the abdomen, although it's quite expensive, potentially toxic, and so I would say marginally effective. But there is an FDA-approved medication for that. <laughs> Not what you want to hear, right? All right. 
one more, a couple more cases in our clinic, and then we're going to go on rounds in the in the clinic in the uh, hospital. So this is a guy now, uh, 57 year old, infected for 22 years. He's doing really well as far as therapy is concerned. CD4 count 448, almost normal, not quite. Viral load is undetectable and has been so for a number of years on his current meds, which he takes regularly and doesn't have any problems as far as side effects. Uh, he's 57 and has um, started to accumulate some of our uh, conditions that we are all more prone to as we age, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Um, and he developed a sudden onset of chest pain and was found to have a myocardial infarction. This is not a diagnostic dilemma. He had a heart attack. He's 57. He's kind of young. I can tell you in my patient panel of somewhere around 200 HIV-infected patients in the last two years, I've had six men have heart attacks. Um, between the ages of 37 and 61. Um, so we're seeing these conditions. This is one of the new faces of HIV and AIDS. What you've seen from some of these other conditions are the opportunistic infections. What we're seeing now, in addition to that, are really some of these uh, other organ systems of the body um, showing signs of damage from HIV and AIDS. Exactly how that happens is still debated. We think um, uh, one of the leading theories is it's due to inflammation that HIV sets up in the body, even when it's well controlled, there are uh, markers of increased inflammation. Um, out of control HIV has much more inflammation, and that inflammation can cause um, bystander damage, damage to the, uh, the blood vessels to other organs. And we're seeing uh, some of these conditions of aging show up earlier in our patients with HIV and AIDS. One of the early ones that we're seeing is heart disease. Um, and one of the rules of thumb is we're seeing it 10 years earlier than we would have otherwise. So there seems to be a condition that was generally thought of as premature aging of the body and of certain organs that may be driven by inflammation. And we may hear more about that in some uh, future talks. But this is really one of the other things that we're, we're dealing with in our clinic now, not just the classic opportunistic infections, but also other organ dysfunction um, in our patients uh, who have been living with HIV and AIDS. This patient. Um, uh, went to the hospital for his uh, uh, acute heart attack. He had a catheterization and he had blockages in multiple arteries um, and he had two stents placed, which uh, relieved his uh, symptoms and actually had preserved for the most part his cardiac function. Uh, but now in addition to his medications for his HIV, he's on a complete cardiac regimen uh, with aspirin, blood pressure medications, lipid lowering agents, hypertensive agents. So. Um, we're really, with this, uh, the accumulation of these conditions, really also adding to the complexity for patients in terms of their uh, medication management. Um, uh, so it, just, it, it makes things uh, also more complicated. So the issue of HIV and aging, I just want to touch on briefly. This is one of the uh, new frontiers of HIV. Uh, we hope that for people that we're not able to prevent infection in, that we're able to diagnose them early and keep them healthy for a long period of time. Um, and the medications we have now are able to extend life almost to a normal lifespan for people who are infected with HIV and AIDS. I always tell my patients on their first visit they have to plan for retirement now. Our patients have to plan to be old. They have to plan for the rest of their life. Uh, I think in 1984 we were probably telling patients, you know, live your life in the next two years. And now I say you have to plan for retirement. You have to plan your education. You have to plan your family. We can help you with all of that. We can help you disclose. We can help you build relationships. We can help you create family if that's what you want. Um, you need to be finishing your education. You need to be having a job. You need to be having a retirement account. You have to deal with all that stuff because we want to see you get old and we can help that. Um, but by 2015, it's estimated that over half of all people living in the United States with HIV will be at least 50 years old, and that's kind of unheard of. In our clinic, the average age is now 48, and I think that the patients that Dr. Levy and, and was seeing early on would have been probably young guys in their 20s and 30s. Um, and at one time, the average age in our clinic was 38. It's now 48. So people are living older, and we have to be prepared for this. Um, and we talked a bit about this issues of premature aging, which we are seeing both in the clinic and we're seeing in the laboratory, we're seeing cellular correlates of that with immune system cells that appear to function as if they're from an older person than the person they came from. Um, this is a very hot area of active research, and I think a lot more will be learned about that in the coming years. Um, our final case in the clinic on our morning session, a 38-year-old uh, gay man with HIV. 
His CD4 count was 328. His viral load was undetectable. He'd been on stable antiretroviral medications for a number of years. Uh, he actually moved to San Francisco just last year from Los Angeles. Um, six months after coming to San Francisco, has re rectal gonorrhea, um, sort of certainly a hallmark for unprotected and uh, potentially risky sex. Um, and now, three months later, is coming in for a routine check, feels very well, and his liver enzymes are markedly elevated. His, for those of you who are familiar with these tests, his ALT and AST are over 1,100. A normal value on that is around 40 or less. So these are really markedly elevated liver function, indicating some damage to his liver. And again, he feels absolutely fine. This was really a surprise on just some routine lab monitoring. What do you guys think is going on here? Hepatitis, certainly one we have to think about. Medication toxicity, always have to think about that. Alcohol, certainly. Lots of toxins we put in our bodies. Drug use. Drug use. A number of other infections. Infectious mono. It's a little bit high for these en enzymes to be for infectious mono. Syphilitic hepatitis could do it. He got gonorrhea. He certainly has been exposed to potentially syphilis. So he was that's our differential diagnosis. And he was exposed, uh, tested for all of that, and it turns out he does, in fact, have new hepatitis C infection, which he acquired sexually. This was a really interesting case. This guy um, was a very well-informed uh, gay man, active member of the community, and understood his risk. When he was diagnosed with HIV, I didn't know him then, but he said it wasn't that much of a shock to him. When I told him he had hepatitis C, he broke down and started crying and said that that was a more devastating diagnosis to him than his HIV because he didn't know that he was at risk. So this is an, an area that we're seeing more. Um, transmission of hepatitis C primarily among men who have sex with men who are HIV positive. Um, we are trying to understand why that is, but we're certainly seeing it. We see two or so cases a month in our clinic of new hepatitis C infection. And this is an area that we um, really need to, I think, to get a lot of public awareness about and some understanding to reduce people's risk. So hepatitis C virus is very common in HIV. You're going to hear a lot more about this in an upcoming lecture. But almost a third of people with, hepatitis, with HIV also have hepatitis C because these two viruses share roots of infection. Um, and we are, as I mentioned, seeing increased numbers of uh, new hepatitis C infections in uh, an HIV positive gay men. It's very important that we identify these infections, both for epidemiologic purposes, so we can educate people and prevent further uh, transmission of infection, but also because uh, treatment during this acute phase is particularly effective. The treatments that we have now uh, work much better before the virus has a chance to really take hold. So in the first six months, hepatitis C is a curable infection. Um, unlike HIV, which Dr. Levy outlined, hepatitis C does not integrate into the human uh, genome, and we can cure it. Um, and we can do that more effectively if we diagnose the infection very early. All right, so that was our morning session. We wrap up things in clinic. We grab a quick bite on the way to the hospital. And we're going to do rounds now. So the next uh, few cases we're going to see are people that are hospitalized at San Francisco General. Um, and I should have mentioned earlier, these cases, some of them are actually uh, exactly as they presented. Some are uh, uh, an amalgam of a couple different cases, and some are tweaked a bit. I took the liberty of doing that for educational purposes. And none of them really highlight the complexity of all of the other psychosocial issues that play into uh, managing uh, these conditions, which um, are really something that we need to address uh, quite proactively in, in, in making sure that treatment is effective. Um, so this gentleman, 33-year-old man, who's hospitalized at San Francisco General, um, where he's been recently diagnosed with tuberculosis. He's initiated treatment for both HIV and tuberculosis. And he says, oh yeah, by the way, I've noticed these three to four lesions, spots, on my chest and arm that have really been there over the last couple of months. They're red. They are a little tender. They don't hurt very much. Um, and here's what they look like. Um, it looks kind of like a nipple. This is not a nipple. This is actually on the gentleman's chest. It's a red raised lesion, a little bit of erythema, a little bit of redness around it. Um, you may be able to see this bit of uh, uh, skin or scale at the, kind of the top of this uh, round papule. Does anybody want to comment or thoughts about what this would be? Capaces, absolutely. We saw the pictures from Dr. Levy. Purple lesions on the skin, you have to think about capaces. All right, so this is one I put in. I knew I had to stump you at some point. 
Um, that's what you have to do as a professor, is you have to stump the students. Otherwise, you're not doing your job. So certainly, capacity is high on our differential for this. Turns out that this is another condition that looks quite a bit like Kaposi's um, called bacillary angiomatosis. It's a, an infection caused by uh, an organism called Bartonella. Bartonella infection, this is a common uh, bacterial infection. It's uh, uh, transmitted to humans often from kittens or cats. Um, on the skin, Bartonella causes bacillary angiomatosis in people with HIV and AIDS. Um, and the classic dermatologic uh, description of those lesions are friable vascular papules, plaques, and nodules, which are often tender with surrounding erythema. Um, this is one that we see a few times a year uh, in the clinic uh, or in the, the wards, and it's always a great one to teach the residents about. Um, again, the major differential, as you all highlighted, is to distinguish this from Kaposi sarcoma because the conditions are treated very, very differently. Um, to diagnose them, the skin biopsy is the test of choice, and there are some special stains that we do to identify this condition. Um, we can also do blood tests for culture or antibodies to help us diagnose Bartonella, but really for this, the skin biopsy is what we want to go for. Um, the difference here is Bartonella is treated with oral antibiotics. There are a number of different antibiotics that can treat uh, Bartonella. Macrolide antibiotics like erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, or uh, doxycycline, some of the tetracycline antibiotics, and many others also may treat Bartonella, but those are the main ones. This condition was described uh, first in a case series from San Francisco General Hospital by one of the professors here, uh, now Dr. Jane Kaler, um, who described this in patients with HIV and AIDS at San Francisco General. Um, we do, in people at risk for this, uh, we can talk about, it's really the fleas that are on cats where this condition comes from. Um, and we talk about uh, flea control in kittens or cats for people at risk. Um, different species of this bacterium also cause other conditions, cat scratch fever, Trench fever, which was a common, very, very common condition in World War I. Um, peliosis hepatis, which are similar lesions, but instead of on the skin, they're vascular lesions inside the liver. Um, and endocarditis, or an infection uh, inside the heart. And we're distinguishing this from Kaposi's sarcoma. You've seen those lesions. Uh, these are lesions uh, of Kaposi's sarcoma on the skin. You can see how they do look quite a bit like the lesion that our patient had, so it's really important that we distinguish this. Um, the bottom left picture is a, a patient in our clinic currently who has Kaposi sarcoma of the mouth. Um, and you can see those purple lesions on his hard palate and on his gums. Um, those are uh, lesions of Kaposi's. Kaposi's is an infection, but it, the manifestation is really a tumor of the skin, oral cavity, GI tract, or the lungs. Other, con other organs can also be uh, involved. As uh, was previously pointed out, it's caused by another herpes virus, human herpes virus 8 sometimes called Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus, which is transmitted through saliva. Um, many people are positive for having exposure to this infection and don't get sick. Uh, when the immune system gets weak, Kaposi sarcoma can be the manifestation. Um, when we diagnose this infection, our first line of treatment, interestingly, is not targeted at the, the uh, cancer. It's not targeted at the Kaposi sarcoma virus. It's targeted at HIV. And when we treat HIV and the immune system gets healthier, the immune system will take care of Kaposi sarcoma in a lot of people. Now, if the Kaposi sarcoma is refractory, is more severe, or uh, involves other critical organs, we may need to add chemotherapy uh, to our regimen. But really, one of the cornerstones here is treating the HIV so the immune system can turn around and do its job to take care of these other infections. All right, case number eight. This is a 37-year-old man who has been out of care. When he was last in care was a year ago. His CD4 count then was 120. So he's not been in care. We can estimate it's got to be lower than 120 now. It doesn't go up without treatment. He came to the emergency department with three weeks of a dry cough, shortness of breath, and night sweats. His vital signs show that he has a low-grade fever and low levels of oxygen in his blood. And here's a chest x-ray. So on the right, I've put a normal chest x-ray, and you can see the lungs, which are the dark areas, should be almost black. So the air, the x-ray fully penetrates the aerated lung tissue. And in our patient, there's a lot of infiltrate, both sides. Anybody have thoughts about what this is? Great, pneumocystis pneumonia. Again, there's a differential diagnosis here. You all nailed it, and I'm presenting you kind of the classic cases. Tuberculosis, yeah. cryptococcal pneumonia. 
There's no cavitation. So cavitation is a hallmark of tuberculosis. In people with immune suppression from HIV, we can have atypical presentations where there is no cavity. So it's important to think about some of these typical infections um, in people who are, have healthy immune systems can present in unusual or different ways in people with um, HIV. So it would be appropriate, and what was done appropriately for this patient was to isolate him, rule him out for tuberculosis. By ruling out, it means we think about that, we do the test, and we make sure it's not tuberculosis. And he actually had a bronchoscopy, um, which uh, did, in fact, confirm his diagnosis of pneumocystis pneumonia. So pneumocystis is caused uh, by an organism, a fungus, that's really specific to humans. It's not found in other, uh, organ in other uh, uh, organisms, in other uh, animals. There are other pneumocystis species that are, but the pneumocystis urovecchii is unique to humans. Um, it used to be called pneumocystis carinii. Turns out the carinii is actually the pneumocystis of dogs, hence carinii, and we've been able now to distinguish that that's different from what's in humans, which is urovecchii. Uh, pneumocystis is ubiquitous. It's found in all contents, uh, continents except Antarctica. And by age four, 75% of children will test positive for having been exposed to it. But you don't hear about this infection in people with healthy immune systems. This is a true opportunistic infection. It doesn't take a hold until the immune system gets weakened. We can diagnose it by typical presentation, x-rays and CAT scans. Um, typically, the CD4 count is less than 200. And we can identify the sputum as uh, was shown earlier in samples from induced sputum or bronchoalveolar lavage. Here is an example of the pneumocystis uh, trophozoites in a, a bronchial lavage uh, uh, specimen. We treat pneumocystis with antibiotics. There are a number which are effective. Uh, sulfa antibiotics are our mainstay. It's a 21-day course. And interestingly, with pneumocystis, we also give prednisone. We give steroids. Uh, particularly for moderate to severe pneumocystis, because if we kill this organism, it actually induces a new inflammatory response and people can get worse from effective treatment. So at the same time we're treating the infection, we try to block some of the immune response with steroids so that people don't get worse while they're getting better. Um, and, we, uh, and people who are at risk for pneumocystis, we give them antibiotics to prevent infection. Another cornerstone of treating many of these, if not all of these, opportunistic infections that we've really learned over the last few years is not just to treat the infection, but to treat the HIV at the same time and right away. Because for a while we didn't know if that was actually going to help or hurt, but a large study actually showed that when we start the HIV medications soon after diagnosing and treating these opportunistic infections, we give patients a mortality benefit. We prevent people from having new AIDS diagnoses or death by starting the HIV medications right away. So that's another cornerstone of our treatment of many of these opportunistic infections. All right, a couple more cases. Um, this is a 45-year-old man with advanced AIDS, visual changes, and personality changes. This is his MRI scan. And to orient you, an MRI scan would be a cut this way, in this case, through the brain. Uh, the patient would be lying on his back with his feet sticking out. Um, his right side would be on your left, and his left side would be on your right. Um, this is uh, a cut through the middle, middle section of the brain. And the area on the bottom right there where it's really, really white on one side and not really, really white on the other side is what the abnormality is. Does anybody know what kind of uh, condition would cause an advanced AIDS? Personality changes, behavior changes, may cause visual changes. Dementia, absolutely. We have to think about dementia. Um, AIDS-associated dementia, terrible, terrible disease and something we see fortunately less of. We see a lot more subtle neurocognitive changes now with effective HIV therapy, but AIDS dementia is definitely on the list. This turns out to be PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which means damage to the white matter tracts in the brain caused by a virus, JC virus, um, generally, people with this in, uh, uh, infection and these clinical manifestations will have CD4 counts less than 100. And this is a very insidious um, but relentless uh, clinical presentation. Generally, a single neurologic deficit first, but then multiple deficits begin to accumulate. Cognitive impairment can occur, um, seizures. Um, in general, people remain alert. They don't go into a coma, for example, um, until late in the course. We talked about the differential diagnosis. Uh, AIDS, dementia, other central nervous system infections 
can cause this. Uh, we can diagnose it by characteristic MRI appearance. Um, we will do a spinal tap and look for the virus present uh, in the spinal fluid. Um, rarely, we need to do a brain biopsy to diagnose this. Typically, we don't have to do that. Um, and again, there's no specific treatment for this infection, but treating the HIV um, is our mainstay. Some of these deficits may be reversible over time and some may not. So even when someone recovers uh, their immune function, um, all of these, uh, the damage that's been done here may not reverse. All right, a couple more. Ten year, uh, case 10, 29-year-old transgender female with a CD4 count of 120 and a headache for two weeks. Thoughts about what would cause a headache? If you saw this on our spinal fluid. So we do a spinal tap. We don't do this test anymore. This is India ink. But this is actually the directly taking spinal fluid, putting a drop of India ink and looking under the microscope. And those round things, does anybody know what those are? Those are yeast. Those are cryptococcus. The organism is actually the small circle in the middle, and the halo is a polysaccharide or a sugar capsule around the, uh, the yeast. Um, this yeast, cryptococcus, um, is very common environmental fungus. It's associated with bird droppings, but it's around everywhere in the environment. It's another true opportunistic pathogen. It doesn't cause disease when people are healthy, but when the immune system drops, people can get sick, very, very sick with a severe meningitis from this. Um, slowly progressive headache, it's not some of the bacterial meningitis types where the headache may come on very, very quick, quickly. It's more of a slowly progressive headache, stiff neck, nausea, vomiting. Um, the infection is present in the blood as well. And we can diagnose it by culturing from the fluid or we can test for the, uh, the infection in, in the blood or the spinal fluid. And when we diagnose it, we give um, pretty high-powered antifungal agents here. Um, intravenous for a few weeks, um, and then uh, long courses of oral antifungals until the immune system is healthy again. And once the CD4 count gets high, we can stop the treatment because the immune system again will kick in and control this infection. Um, we also have to worry about increased pressure in the fluid around the brain, so these patients may need spinal taps on an every other day basis for a while just to relieve the pressure and reduce the uh, swelling. So this is a 48-year-old man who started his HIV treatment six months ago when his CD4 count was 57 and viral load was very high. And now, six months in, he's got a new symptom. Two weeks ago, he developed uh, a mass in his neck that's been enlarging, um, pain, and the CD4 count is showing signs of recovery and his viral load is on the way down. So good response to treatment. And he's admitted to the hospital to have this further evaluated. So you order a CAT scan and a biopsy. Here's what this CAT scan looks like. This is his neck. Um, you can see the vertebrae is in the white. The, uh, the, the circle in the middle at the top that's black is his trachea. That area that I highlighted is actually uh, an enlarged and necrotic lymph node. Lymphoma. We have to worry about lymphoma. It certainly could be. This could absolutely be lymphoma. It turned out it wasn't in this case, but that's high on our differential diagnosis. Um, we did the biopsy. We saw a number of uh, cells that are loaded with mycobacterial infection. So this is MAC, Mycobacterium avium intracellulare, or Mycobacterium avium complex. It's an organism related to tuberculosis, my, tuberculosis also being a mycobacterial infection. This organism is also found everywhere. It's ubiquitous, soil, food, water. And clinically, when people get low CD4 counts, they can have a systemic syndrome, fever, weight loss, night sweats, and we can detect the uh, infection in the blood, or it can uh, uh, locate in lymph nodes, and people can get swollen, tender lymph nodes. And we can diagnose this by finding the organism in blood on, uh, or on cultures of the bone marrow or uh, lymph nodes. We treat it with oral antibiotics for very prolonged courses. And because we're, uh, people are at risk for this, we also prevent it by giving people antibiotics when they're at risk for it with low CD4 count. And the unique feature of this, this is another sort of modern um, uh, clinical presentation of HIV and AIDS, is the immune reconstitution syndrome. And I'm not going to go into detail about this for time's reason for time reasons, but essentially when we um, treat someone with effective therapy, we can um, allow the immune system to begin to wake up, to begin to become active again fairly quickly, and we can see within days, weeks, or months that people can develop immune responses to these infections that previously there really weren't. So they can have actually a paradoxical worsening of their syndromes after we start treatment because their immune system is now adding to the picture and reacting. Um, it's a very difficult condition to, to 
to diagnose. We have, there's no special test for it. We have to make sure we're not missing some other infection or dealing with resistant organisms. Um, and what we do with this immune reconstitution syndrome is we just plug through. So we don't stop treatment. We can give people um, immune suppressive medications like prednisone if the symptoms are very bad. Um, if it's life threatening, we may need to stop treatment, but that's very rare. Instead, uh, as Dr. Havlier has taught me and others, we have our patients sort of brace for a roller coaster in this first year. After they start antiretroviral therapy, any number of things can happen when CD4 counts are very low. And this is one of the things that we see commonly and we have to prepare patients for. So just to summarize, so when we're managing HIV-infected patients, the degree of immunosuppression is really key to how we uh, look for certain conditions. Opportunistic infections are still seen today, AIDS circa 1982. But our goal is to diagnose patients very early and engage them in care so they can start the uh, treatment and benefit from all of the uh, uh, medications and advances that we have in, in managing HIV today. Um, and importantly, people with HIV can also get everything else that anybody else can get too. So the same illnesses that um, cause uh, disease in HIV uninfected can also cause disease in HIV infected people. And some of those conditions may be even more aggressive or show up um, with uh, abnormal presentations or at younger ages in our HIV infected patients. So that was a quick tour through the clinic and the um, hospital. Thanks for joining me on rounds.